And coming to the stage right now, the director and co-writer, Chris Lowell. Hey, y'all. Thanks for coming out. Hey, Chris. Hey, what's up, Ricky? How's it going? (laughs) Not too bad, man. Uh, Let's talk a little bit. I mean, just watching the trailer, I'm thinking about how much drinking there is in the movie. There's a lot of drinking in the film. How much your actors had to pretend to be drunk or were drunk. What uh, What was the vibe like on set when you guys had to do a lot of those scenes? Um, well, basically, what we did was we had the uh, <laughs> we had the cast up to the the house um, about a week beforehand to do rehearsals, and uh, they lived in the house. They cooked, they ate, they played whiskey slaps, they they uh, went skinny dipping. They basically lived out as much of the film kind of as possible, which was actually great because when we went to start shooting, there was already the shared history, which is a ne- which is completely necessary for a film like this about old friends. You really need to establish like a true, genuine feeling of a shared history. And so when the cameras start rolling, everyone is extremely comfortable with each other, with the crew. That's exactly right. Um, and then when it actually came time to shooting, while it was unofficial, I, I feel like in the whiskey slap scene, there may or may not have actually been whiskey being drunk. Um, Did you right. turn a blind eye? What's that? You turned a blind eye? I, 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 I don't know anything, you know? Um, I'm also a producer on the film, so I can't like openly endorse that kind of behavior. But I, I know Ryan Eggold would, had no problem just walking around with an open beer can pretty much the entirety of the shoot. Talk about when you decided that you wanted to make a feature film and what the writing process was like for you and your, your co-writer. Yeah, so I wrote this film with my buddy Mo Narang, and uh, we were at my family's house in North Georgia where I grew up with all of my friends. And uh, Mo and I started... It was the first time we'd written together, so we were trying to think of something, and we were sort of wanting to write something, write about something that made us afraid. So we'd both just recently gone through our parents' wills with them, so that was on our mind. And we were at the house. I was like, what if we ever lost this place or our friends? And then um, coincidentally and sort of tragically within a year, my folks actually sold the house and uh, several of our friends' parents started getting sick. And uh, suddenly this film, which was completely a fiction, became a much more serious uh, story that we wanted to tell as authentically and realistically as possible. Um, And so that's how this film kind of came to fruition. And you shot the film on 16 millimeter. We've talked about this before and how beautiful it looks because of that, but how much of a uh, process that was for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge nightmare. Well, you know, for me, it was great. For, for producers, I always say, like, if you want to see gray hairs actively grow on a producer's head, you, um, you, 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 know, you tell them that you want to shoot it on film. Um, actually, I just realized our DP is here right now. Um, this is oh, Tim Naylor. Right. Tim Naylor shot the film. Um, and uh, it was funny, when we, were, when we were looking for cinematographers, one of the most difficult things was finding a DP who wasn't terrified of shooting on film. Because nowadays, so often, like most up-and-coming cinematographers, they just, they, they just shy away from it. They're, they're way more confident with the Alexa and the RED and other digital formats, which are amazing. But I really felt this film needed to be shot on film for a num- number of reasons. Um, the most obvious is that this is a film like just bathing in nostalgia. And film, sadly, uh, is kind of immediately nostalgic, especially nowadays, um, especially things like Super 8, which we experiment quite a bit with in the film. It just, it just feels different. And in a world of independent cinema today, where it's all digital, um, when, you can, when you can feel the grain, the constant movement, you know, we keep, there's a lot of dust and hair still left in the film. It just gives it a, a level of authenticity and nostalgia and, and just a different look than what you see out there nowadays. You, uh, you've been working in television for a long time with a lot of really uh, incredible writers and showrunners. Uh, in the credits, you see a few of those names. What role did they have uh, in your writing process, in your thought process in, in making the movie? Well, what was really awesome is, um, you know, Mo and I originally never really thought this would turn into a film. We never really thought it would come to fruition. So it, was, it began just more as like a writing exercise for the two of us. So what we would do is we would write a draft and then I would send it off to Jason Reitman, who I worked with on Up in the Air, or I would send it to Tate Taylor, who directed me in The Help, um, or any number of other great screenwriters, directors. I'd send it to Rob Thomas. And, the and guy I would from Matchbox these, 20. Yeah, yeah, the guy from Matchbox 20, who had great lyric notes um, that, I, that I cut. Um, <laughs> no, but... Uh, but it was wonderful because they would, I would just get this great, these just unbelievable notes back. And then once we actually finished shooting the film, I invited all those same people to be in the editing room when we were doing test screenings. 
and they they had equally helpful broader notes and also a lot of really great micro notes and it's wonderful did you ever feel intimidated by showing them your work considering you're working with or you're showing jason reitman who's been nominated for an oscar or people like that not really. I mean, I, I wouldn't show the film to anybody that I wouldn't consider a, a friend. I mean, a, a, otherwise, it's sort of a recipe for disaster. Um, and they, they were all... I, what I've learned is I feel like with actors, oftentimes, there's this real sense of competition, and you don't really want to share or give advice because it just feels a lot more dog-eat-dog. Dog. Whereas with directing, I think just getting a film made is like one of the most difficult things in the world and it's so personal to the director that there's a lack of competition felt. I felt more often that any director I spoke to about it was more than willing to offer their thoughts, their advice, their help in any way that they could. It was great. Uh, talk a little bit about the casting. Some of these people are old friends of yours. Yeah, well, actually, really, the only person I knew um, prior to this movie was Beck Bennett, who's got the mustache over there. Beck's on um, Saturday Night Live now, and he's also the guy in all those AT&T commercials with the kids. <laughs> um, and Beck was my roommate freshman year of college. He's, a, he's just a genius actor, and I actually think this film really showcases what he's made of. Um, more than just the, the comedic side. But every, every other one of the actors, um, we sort of had a blanket rule for the film, again, something that producers hate, which is that um, Mo and I had watched every single reunion film out there, from the ones that worked to all the ones that really did not work, of which there are plenty more. And one of the things that we noticed uh, in a lot of the films that didn't work is they would be stacked with celebrities, which I understand the reason behind that um, but the problem is, for an audience, when you're watching it, if it's about old friends, the moment they show up on camera, you're like, you're not old friends, you're from this movie, and you're from that TV show, and it kind of, you sort of immediately put it at arm's length. You'd almost rather be seeing them share Hollywood stories. Yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah kind, exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah, they're talking about, like, you know, how drunk they got at the awards parties or something. Um, that sounds awesome. I, I, you know, I'm going to make that movie next. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Part two. But uh, so when we were casting, I really wanted to work with actors who were willing to commit to auditioning for the film, to table reads, to chemistry reads, to rehearsals, um, and to run of pictures. So there wasn't a prescribed hierarchy. It really felt like... And, and then also I kind of wanted to work with up-and-coming talent. So the casting directors of this film also did uh, the help with me. They did August Osage County. And they, and they are also super well-known for breaking new talent because they cast things like Winter's Bone and... Boys Don't Cry. And so when I, when I met with them, I was like, I want to see all the up-and-coming talent. I want to see all the people who haven't had their moment yet. And they brought in this remarkable group of actors. And, and the way I was able to sort of placate the producers is I was like, I want to be the movie that 10 years from now people look back on and say, like, how on God's earth did they get this fucking cast together? You know what I mean? Sort of like a dazed and confused. Yeah, sure, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, what was the number one reunion-inspired movie? Oh, um, I mean, I think it would be ludicrous not to acknowledge movies like The Big Chill, which are obviously very iconic for the reunion genre. So uh, Return of Sakaka 7 is an amazing one as well. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think uh, well, actually the one that Mo and I probably watched the most is, is this movie Jules et Jim by Truffaut. Um, it, it, it's, it's great. It's about friendship. They go away. They come back. The friendship gets, you know, broken a few times. There's a great love triangle. There's a lot of games. There's a lot of play in it, which I really loved. So those, those, those were probably the films that we kind of kept thinking of. And so not only shooting on film, you also are showcasing a lot of your own photographs. You're a photographer, and you use as a sort of uh, narrative uh, tool these photographs to showcase memory, thoughts all the time. That's right, yeah. So there's this big... Because this film was inspired by a lot of the things that happened to me, even though those things happened to me after we'd written the script, there's this sort of like art imitating life, imitating art theme kind of going on throughout. And we find various ways of, of sort of sprinkling that in, whether it's cutting to these black and white photographs, which are my photographs that I took, most of which appear in the film, were ones that I took at our house in Georgia, which sort of signify uh, the protagonists drifting away into whatever delusions he's having. Um, we also keep a lot of the rollouts. Um, so when you're shooting on film, anytime there's light leaks or overexposure or you're changing the mag, the film sort of it has this beautiful run of color as it's being emptied out. And we actually begin the film with all the rollouts. Um, so that was another big element. Uh, I happen to love on set 
horror stories. And I know that you were shooting on film and that there were some days where you got a little, uh, you know, you, it was a bit tragic for you. What was your, your worst moment on set? Uh, <laughs> well, there were definitely times where, you know, when you're shooting on film, you, you get what are called dailies. So you send the film off to, we shot it, we would send it to Deluxe in New York, and then the next day you get all the dailies back. But because we were such a low budget, and because we were in rural northern Michigan, we were getting weeklies. So, you know, in the middle of week two, we would get the dailies back from week one, and it would, we'd see, like, oh, no, there's... You know, we had a hair in the lens here, or the they they processed it wrong at Deluxe, and now there's static, and we have to reshoot these sequences, and that was always a little bit nerve wracking because it was something. It wasn't what we shot yesterday; it was what we shot a week and yesterday. You know what I mean? Um, which was terrifying. Um, I think one of our finest hours, though, uh, and was it could have been a it could have destroyed the film was right towards the end. We were shooting splits, which means we were shooting half day, half night. The day before we'd gotten backed up, we couldn't finish some stuff, so we had to like really be on our A game. That's right. Um, so we, we, we shot one of the most emotional scenes in the film during the day, it went great. Um, Ryan Eggold killed it. We, went, we broke for lunch. The next day we were shooting some interiors where everyone was on their A game, and then the power went out. So it's not a big deal. It's like, oh, we blew a fuse. I'm sort of, everyone's kind of waiting patiently for it to get fixed. And then in the background, I remember outside hearing one of the grips yell, looks like it's the whole neighborhood. And what we had done was <laughs> we'd been plugging directly into the, basically into a power line, and it sucked all the power for the entire grid of Petoskey, Michigan. And um, it's, you know, 2 a.m. on a Sunday, so it's not like in New York where you just, like, have someone there. So one of our producers called 911, and the 911 operator's like, what's the state of your emergency? And he's like, we're making a movie, we lost power! Which I think in any other place, they'd be like, get off the phone. Um, but instead, this woman was like, hold on a second. And she like hangs up, calls the electrician, calls back to the producer, and she's like, hey, I called the electric company. They're going to be out there to help you guys out. What's the movie about? Um, which is amazing. And so that's exactly what happened. Uh, we ended up shooting on what's called a putt-putt generator, like a gas power generator. We had to re sort of dis decide how we were going to shoot certain things. We had to do a couple oneers. Um, and then they came, they, they got the power fixed, they put a new lock on the thing that we had broken. Um, we ran the power off it again, and uh, were able to get our shots. I mean, literally the last shot of the night was this shot with basically a bunch of our actors completely naked as the sun was coming up, and we like ran into the woods to get this big wide shot of it. And that was it, we cut, we opened a bottle of bourbon, everyone was celebrating, it was, was a great way to be at like Monday at 6 a.m. You know? now, now that story took three minutes to tell, but the actual event itself had to take a few hours to resolve itself, right? Hours, in the dark. What were you doing during those hours? What was going through your head? Well, see, that's the thing, that's what I'm saying. It was like, it was like our finest hour because that was the moment of panic. That's the moment where everyone's allowed to freak out. And no one did, everyone was super calm, it was very much like, okay, it wasn't this is going to destroy us. It was how are we going to how are we going to rise above this? It really was amazing to watch from the DPs figuring it out with um, our chief electrician, like how are we what can we shoot on, what can we shoot, to the actors rearranging all of their blocking, to the producers keeping everyone calm. I mean it was it was definitely like a, I mean I, I remember being unusually calm. That's incredible. Yeah, it was I good. I would pacing, crying. Well, what's so funny is that like every out. other thing, like you know, every other little much smaller tragedy, I would have complete meltdowns over. Like the the crew doesn't like the food, you know, and I'd be like, God damn it, you know, freaking out. Um, and it's like that. That's easy to fix. And like I, I, I just said I didn't like this one thing. It's not that bad. You don't need to freak out. Right. Right. Exactly. No, I, I was not. I, 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 my, my barometer for like when to have meltdowns was way askew. Uh, should we take another look at a, a, yeah, yeah, take a sure. look at a clip? Let's take a look at the uh, whiskey slap scene. Great. Now, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We weren't. That wasn't even scripted. That was just those guys hanging out. <laughs> now you you've done this before in real life, outside of the last time. But yeah, where you it came and from. I and those two actors did it six days ago. Um, <laughs> actually, I got to slap Reed Scott in the face. It, it was, was really great. awesome. Beck got to slap me in the face so hard. Twice. Twice. Well, you asked for it harder the well, second yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's fucked up. But that's exactly what happened. Um, so yeah, the, the the genesis of this stupid stupid game uh, in my life was. Um, 
I was in college. Uh, we were passing around some disgusting bottle, plastic bottle of whiskey, and uh, chasing it with soda or something. Um, and I ran out. We ran out of soda, so I was like, "Okay, just someone give." I, I can't. I need. I can't just drink this liquor. I have to chase it with something. And my friend Lindsay was like, "Just take the shot. I'll slap you across the face. I'll take the burn right away." And at the time, it was like, "This is genius." Um, it's not. Uh, <laughs> and it kind of became a sort of a ritual for us. Um, for a lot of our friends. I've, I've done it on just about every job I've worked on, which is also not a good idea. Um, but it's actually great. I think, um, I mean, out of context, that's all you get to see. But if you watch the film, I think we actually do a really good job of not just throwing in this fun game, this fun, stupid game, but actually using it to elevate the, the plot and to sort of raise the stakes. Um, there's two versions of Whiskey Slaps played in the film. This one, which is very kind of playful and edgy and strange, and then it comes back again later in the film in a much more dramatic, frightening way. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely not just a one-off bit. It's a whole part of the, part of the narrative. Um, came from college. Yeah, it came from college. Of course. I can't <laughs> yeah. imagine it came from any place else. <laughs> um, which is, which is, what's interesting about that is that I'm still in college, so I can say basically anything for the last 12 years happened in college. Uh, a film that deals with uh, the theme of personal growth uh, tends to, and this doesn't, but tends to fall into the sort of uh, ex exposition uh, nightmare a lot of times. Because how else do you portray someone growing? It becomes very hard to figure out how to portray that without having them just coming out sometimes and saying, I feel better now because I've done this and I feel older. How did you, did you ever find yourself having to write yourself out of that hole? Uh, definitely. I think, um, I think in our first draft, probably more as a, an exercise for us as writers, Mo and I wrote sort of the most wrapped up in a bow version of this film um, where all the characters find resolution in all their different ways and we get to see each one of those moments. And then once we had that, and realized how hallmarky, sort of bullshitty it was, we had to go back in and be like, okay, well, what would realistically occur in the span of three days? You know, people aren't gonna find all the answers in that amount of time. Like, what are the resolutions that really matter that we need to see, and what things can be left unsaid? And even with those, how do you do it in a way that doesn't feel like you're just drowning in exposition? How did you work with your with your actors and how did your background as an actor prepare you and help you and maybe at sometimes even limit you? Um, well, well, I think uh, the thing that's really nice about having acted for so many years is that I've worked with a lot of directors, so I've gotten to see what does work on a set, what a well-run set looks like and what a poorly run set looks like. Incidentally, really, the, the big secret is you're just nice to people, in my opinion. You're, you're nice to your crew. Um, and they don't hate your guts. Uh, that's that's kind of like a, you just say thank you a lot. Um, with with the actors, I think I think uh, really uh, my goal was just to build as much trust with them as possible. So, and whatever basically, I, I met with each one of them separately, and I just asked them, what can I do to make you feel as comfortable and as able to take risks when we actually start shooting as possible. And each actor had a different response. Um, some of them you know, liked to be reassured constantly. Other ones liked to be left alone. Some loved rehearsals, others didn't. You know, uh, Ryan Eggold, when you're giving him direction, you kind of have to speak like you're reciting a tone poem because he's very ethereal um, with his direction. Whereas Reed Scott, you'd give him a note and he would just say, faster, slower, quicker, funnier louder, quieter, you know, just like faster, quieter. And he's like, great, I got it. You know, they just all work differently. Did you ever have a moment where you were, you had a learning experience with how to direct actors? You did something, you gave a direction and it didn't work and you said, uh, file that away. That's not how to do it for me. Yeah, well, definitely like, so uh, an example would be Brett Dalton, uh, who's now on this show called Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And this was one of Brett's first jobs. And, um, I remember with Brett, I just loved everything he was doing, and I and I I kind of left him alone. I remember just sort of being like, he's he's kicking ass, and and if I had a note, I would give it, but I didn't really have one for like the first week of shooting. And I remember at the end, we were all saying our goodbyes. I was like, great work today, and he's like, it was okay. Can you just let me know that? I I just don't. And if you could, and I remember being like, oh okay, like communication, even when someone's doing a great job, is important to say like just so you know you're on the right path here. Especially for an actor because that's, that's, especially that's all we fucking want. We just live for that stuff. <laughs> live for reassurance. Live to be told that we're doing a great job. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you when you were going into financing this film, were there any uh, any decisions, any compromises that you had to make coming off of the script into financing? Uh, no, and I actually think that's unbelievably rare. Um, for a first-time filmmaker especially, you know, I got final cut of the film. I didn't have to 
make edits according to a studio or a producer. I wasn't limited to my cast. I didn't have to have a certain actor in the film in order to get financing. Um, I was able to shoot on film, which wasn't necessarily economically uh, smart. Um, what do you attribute this to? Were you just very good at pitching and having a clear vision and everyone understood where you were coming from so no one felt like they could, I don't want to say undermine you, but you know, sort of be like, well, it doesn't seem like he has this plan, so maybe we should try to assert something there. I, I think it was two things. I think, I think part of it was that um, I was really good at pitching the film, but more importantly, I was good at pitching the film. I pitched it with my writing partner, Mo, and Mo comes from a financial background, so we would go into a room and I would ramble about why this film needed to be made and why it would be different from other reunion films and what I was going to do and the people that I could lean on to help with the film, and, and that really got people excited. And then when it came time to talk about um, the actual terms of the contract of what the investment uh, proposal would look like, um, Mo was able to kind of swoop in and and speak, you know, like a like an intelligent human being who could crunch numbers, and I think that like placated a lot of people who were a little bit nervous about where they were spending their money, you know. There's a great um, not series of scenes in the film that are cut next to each other to showcase. We kind of see it in the trailer how everyone is responding to the night before and their particular actions. I'm wondering if in the original script you had it cut like that, where each scene was playing against each other, or if you had them separate. No, that was done. That was exactly how we did. So basically, what happens is there's three scenes going on at once, and one sentence from one sequence will be answered by somebody else out of context in a different sequence, and so on and so forth. So they kind of connect together. You see this. I've seen it a few times in plays, but never really in cinema. The closest that Mo and I could find was um, in the Austin Powers movies. There's like this really long dick joke that goes on for like six minutes, where it'll be like. Look up in the sky, it's a big, and then some wood, it'll be like Woody, and it's like there's Woody Harrelson, you know what I mean? It, it sort of keeps going like that. Um, really stupid. I'm mean, hysterical. I love Mike Myers, and I thought that was amazing. But like, it was hard. We we just really hadn't seen anything like that, and uh, we just loved it. And so it's one of our favorite parts of the film, and and that is how we wrote it out. Uh, the classic, I mean, I guess cliche at this point is that when you make a film, you actually make three films. You write it, you shoot it, and then you edit it, and it changes and evolves. Each time, how did this change from the script to shooting to the editing process? Um, well, I, th I really do. I'd heard that a, a million times as well, and it, it's very true, I think, you know, because what we wrote and what we shot and what we edited was actually fairly similar, except that the way I heard it in my head was so different from the way that Aaron Dark or Jesse Hodges or Beck Bennett reads it. Um, so finding that was really interesting, and then you make cuts on, and then there's there's scenes that on the page seem so great, but in when you actually shoot them, you realize you don't need them, or they're actually moving too slow, and other things that you thought were throwaway, throwaway lines, which turn out to be the things that get applause in a theater. Um, and then finally in editing, that really shocked me, because I remember thinking, they always say you can totally change the movie in editing, and I, I was like, whatever, this is an this is a linear story told in three days. There's really not a whole lot of ways you can change it, and that's not true. They're, they're, it's amazing what you can do in an editing, an editing room. And we didn't do any reshoots. I mean, we really only worked with what we had, but it really blew my mind what we were capable, capable of. What kind of stuff did you change in the editing room? Did you find that you were actually moving scenes, different scenes from one place to another? And well, splicing in my photography was like a, an editing choice. We talked about it early on, but it was never really, it was, it was kind of in the corner of my mind, and our editor really kept coming back to that. And I thought that worked really, really well. Um, there, we shoot a, a sequence on Super 8, and we also, there's a, we come back to that later in the film, and I think that works really nicely. Um, it was really getting out of the film that we had a few different versions, um, none of which were the originally scripted version. Uh, we talked about some of the people that you sent the script to that you brought into the editing room to take a look. Uh, people like Jason Reitman, people like Rob Thomas. What were some of the notes that uh, Jason Reitman gave you? <laughs> um, I, I remember like one of the biggest ones like uh, that, well, like a writing note that we got early on from Tate Taylor, who directed The Help. We'd, our first draft was very precious, um, and not a whole lot happened. And I remember Tate saying, okay, here's what, here's what you need to do. Take everything that happens in your third act and put it in your first act and then see what, where the story goes. And I remember being like, well, that's a crazy freaking idea. But he's like, he's like, just every time you think you know what's going to happen, do something else. And it just makes it that much more interesting. Um, and that was, I remember, being a great note. Um, it's also a testament to your commitment 
to this story because taking everything from the third act and moving it to the first is a lot of new work. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> for the thing. It's, that's that's the, the 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 tragedy of getting a great note more often than not is the good news is that you immediately realize it. You're like, oh, that's exactly what needs to happen. Yes, and then you realize all the things that need to happen in order for that decision to take place, for that note to work, and that's always a daunting process. I mean, at times, Mo and I would get notes that we'd be so excited about for about 20 minutes, and then we'd spend the next two weeks just in agony trying to implement those changes. Realizing that now you're not done, and you have a lot of work to do. Not even close to done. Right. (laughs) Uh, Should we take another uh, look at another clip? Uh, sure. Yeah. This is, is um, this is our protagonist Daniel. Um, g- this is Ryan Eggold d- delivering the worst toast of all time. He yes, he was drinking. <laughs> How many times did you perform that speech for yourself while you were writing? Oh, <laughs> uh, it, it's funny. We we typically the monologues like that, these short monologues, would we we would undergo the the original version would be like four pages, and then it would turn into four sentences. We'd be like, we really don't need this. We really don't need it. And then we would sort of let Ryan kind of do what he did. When we actually shot this scene, we had scheduled shooting it over three days, and we ended up shooting it in, what do we do, Tim, like a day and a half, like one night? I mean, I think we really ended up shooting. I just remember when we shot it, I told each of the actors, we're going to do two masters, and then each one of you is going to get two takes. And that's it. Yeah, and we just mo- we burned through it. That's it? That was it. What? What's yeah. that? Yeah, they, that's uh, but, discipline. Did that worry any of them? Did they? Well, that was what was so amazing about these actors, and it was part of the reason. A lot of them have a huge theatrical background, so our film's very dialogue heavy. And a long scene in film and television is usually like a page and a half. You know, it's like if you get a two-page scene, it's like terrifying. And we would have you know fifteen-page scenes, and uh, you know a lot of these actors. I mean, they, they just it, they were so unbelievably professional. I mean, it, you know, in between takes during lunch breaks, they would all be outside in a circle rehearsing, just like making sure they were tight on their lines. And it's the only way we were allowed to shoot in at that kind of pace. There's no way it would have happened otherwise. What scene in the film would you say was your biggest fear going into? The dinner scene, which is that scene there. I mean, just because there were so many moving parts. You've got food, it's at night, you've got all these different people talking, there's a lot of comedic beats that need to be hit. Um, and in, 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 in we, and I, was so, I love that scene so much that I, I had really high hopes for it. And I remember in editing, that was one of the few scenes that as much coverage as we had, it was just so much fun to cut because there were just so many versions of it. Um, and and it, was just, it, was just, it, was, it was it was it was just the best. That was one of the things that I was struck by when I saw the film was that you had clearly set up a fair amount of challenges for yourself that I think a first time director wouldn't normally do that. You know, all of these dialogue-heavy scenes where there's several different moving component, moving parts that different motivations that drive the main motivation, different B stories that are driving the A story, all within five minutes. Were there, were there things when you were writing that you knew this was going to be a big challenge and you wanted to maybe write something different, or did you write to direct even more challenging material for yourself? Yeah, I I mean, I think, you know, where we challenged ourselves, we also saved ourselves. So we definitely took on some big fish in terms of like some of those, like we've got like a lot of characters all doing this scene or we've got skinny dipping sequences or like crazily shot three part sequences. But then at the same time, it's like, okay, but we're going to contain ourselves pretty much to one location, which makes things a lot easier. We're going to work with, it's going to be like a no asshole environment, which really makes things helpful. Um, we weren't dealing with any divas, which was really nice, because um, I've just been on sets as an actor where you are dealing with those kinds of people, and it's just amazing how much harder everything is. No names, but tell a story. No names, but I mean, <laughs> Clooney. Uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> did not Clooney. Um, um, not Clooney, not Clooney. Not Clooney, no, not Clooney. No, 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 no. Did you no, George, don't leave, don't leave. Take that, don't leave. Take oh, that off. Well, all right, well, he's gone. Um, they uh, said this wasn't live, so we're good. Okay, fantastic. Um, no, I, 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 yeah, I think um, we just had like a really driven crew who all seemed to really believe in the project. I mean, one of the most emotional times I had on the film, I think, was our pre-production where you do the, uh, you do your final production meeting where you've got all the, you've got the DP, the, the camera department and the costume department and hair and makeup and every single person has studied your script for weeks now and they all have very meticulous very specific questions, and it, it, I remember being so humbled by how much time and effort and passion people were putting into to these words that Mo and I had written. It was a, it was a really you know pretty amazing experience. 
the filmmaking process, be it shooting or editing, can get kind of exhausting, but it can also lead to new ideas, new thoughts about what you want to do next. Did you finish editing, finish this film, and go right into writing something again? Do you have plans for something new? Yeah, we, we have a couple more projects in the pipeline, um, very different from this, and I think kind of reactionary to this. So In what way? Well, like, for example, this is uh, a lot of principles um, roughly my age. You know, the next film... Or is and it's a linear story. The next film is basically teenagers and adults, um, and it's told non in a nonlinear fashion. And it's a straight drama. It's about um, basically drug abuse, uh, teenage drug abuse and rehabilitation. And um, you know, I think it was just like, a, and I think in a lot of ways it was flexing mu muscles that had been sort of deprived from making this film. Which is almost a subconscious thing. You don't necessarily come out of this and say, I have exactly. to do this different thing. It's a, all of a sudden your brain starts It's all of a sudden I'm like, I really want to tell this kind of story right now. And then about halfway through it, you're like, I wonder why. And then you realize, like, oh, this is why. Right. Absolutely. Should we open it up for questions? Yes, we should. Think? Look at this. Oh, man, Someone right on time. Someone is telling us that we should open it up? If you guys have any questions, fire will. Does anyone have will. any questions? Yeah, what's up, dude? The, um, Kickstarter. Uh, can you just maybe talk about Kickstarter and how that kind of played into the whole financial... Hell yeah, I can. Um, let's talk Kickstarter. Uh, okay, so basically, um, Mo and I raised this, uh, we raised the money for this film um, through private equity, you know, basically asking people for money in their living rooms. Um, and we'd, re we'd reached a ceiling that we'd set for ourselves. And when it came time to actually distribute the film, there were still a series of things we needed to pay for, whether it was e and insurance or... Uh, music licensing or closed captioning, things like that, all sorts of distribution costs, which we hadn't foreseen. And we didn't want to dilute the investments, uh, our, our investors um, that they'd put in. And so really we were kind of backed into a corner where the only thing we could do was a Kickstarter campaign. And I was in the Veronica Mars movie, which is the most successful Kickstarter campaign in history, which is amazing um, and I think people assumed that I would just know how to do it because I was in that movie and I didn't know shit about how to do that stuff in fact I was probably the most averse to doing it because I, I was so kind of social media uh, inept um, I mean you know Mo still has a flip phone I had one while we were shooting I mean this is like the level I'm talking about here were so you, were you also worried that it would maybe feel like you were taking this one thing and 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 playing off of it like yeah exactly using your there was yeah there was a there was a real f I mean I was so proud of how we had raised the original um, capital that I, I was I, I didn't I wasn't sure I wanted to go this route and frankly I didn't think we could do it um, and I actually think it was our lack of understanding that worked to our advantage because, you know, we had people set up Facebook accounts for us and Twitter accounts and, and we learned how to use it um, as in a, the most rudimentary way possible. But I think the way it helped us is that we had such a personal investment in people who helped us out. I mean, we were responding to every tweet we got and Facebook message. And I mean, I think we really got invested in the in the campaign. And I think it was very evident to people that we weren't hiring other people to do this for us, that it was literally us, you know, up until five in the morning, like making sure we got back to, you know, that Jen Blatchley and, you know, like um, Purple Row. Like, have you written back to Purple Row yet? Shit like that. Those were the conversations we were having. Um, and I, and I, I, I would and this is maybe, I hope I'm not shooting myself in the foot, but I would say I, I'd like to believe that anybody who uh, contributed to our campaign, we really want, and anyone who worked on the film, frankly, whether they were an actor or a grip, we, we really kind of wanted to make it our motto that no one would walk away from the, from the project feel, with a bitter taste in their mouth. And that's actually something I think we really did learn from Veronica Mars because that was one thing I remember is when we were shooting that movie, there was a producer on set the entire time whose sole job it was to make sure that we were honoring all of our Kickstarter promises and making sure everybody was, which is amazing on a studio film to have that. And, and it was important to Rob and Kristen and everybody else. And so Mo and I think adopted a, a similar kind of feeling towards the whole process. I mean, these are people who are donating to a film that they have not seen and not getting anything out of it except for these prizes that they're not guaranteed to receive. I mean, it's, it's an amazing amount of trust um, that they are they are giving to us, and so it's it's only it's only you know it's 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 our duty to to honor that trust. Did you realize something new about your own fan base too by having that Kickstarter? That I had one. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I, I mean. mean <laughs> that, uh, yeah. 
As an actor, were you tempted to put a little cameo for yourself in? Or <laughs> Oh, man. It's funny. Uh, I got into filmmaking, I think, originally as a kid because I wanted to act in these projects. And uh, there, there, you know, I, I would basically end up um, casting myself in all of them. Um, and I think I, in my head, I went to film school with the, with the thought that I would get my foot in the door th through editing or cinematography, directing, writing some way, and then eventually I'd get to a place where I could just cast myself in all of my projects. And then ironically, when finally that day came, I didn't want to act in it at all. Um, the reason being, frankly, that uh, in a dream world, right, as an actor, like the goal is that you can shut out everything else except for the person you're acting opposite, that I can ignore the lights and the cameras and, and just focus on you, my acting partner. And I just knew very necessarily if I was a director, I would not be able to do that because I would simultaneously have to also be thinking about the boom mic and the dolly movement. We didn't have a dolly. The boom mic and the camera movement and all these other things. And I just didn't want to put myself in that position. I was worried that if I tried to do both, I wouldn't enjoy either. It's also a small crew, and you're sort of a part of everybody who's paying attention to those things. You're not on the kind of set where, as a director, you can just sort of let those things... You know, have a, a series of assistants working for you or yeah, anything? Yeah. <laughs> no. No, I mean, it was like it would, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go get coffee for everybody and, like, bring it to set. Um, also, frankly, I've worked with a lot of friends of mine. A lot of my friends have worked with actor-directors who are starring in their own projects. And one thing they co often complain about is they'll be like, I I'm working with him, the director, who's also the actor, and we're doing the scene, and I'm, he's supposed to be you know, acting with me, and I can see him just judging my performance and thinking about what notes he's about to give me, which really takes you out of it. Hi. Um, Hi. So I'm an actress and a filmmaker also, and I... Um, I'm curious. I came in late, so I didn't. I don't know if you said this already, but what? So, what was the total budget of the movie? And also, what? How much did you raise on Kickstarter? And how long did it take you to to raise the money? Not on Kickstarter, but just from people. S sure. So the budget was low. Um, it was, uh, for all intents and purposes, comfortably, really comfortably, under a million dollars. I'll say that. Um, really comfortably um, and uh, and we actually raised the money in a kind of record amount of time I mean I think I got spoiled because in 2012 the in January of that year we signed our contract with our producers and by March we'd had all the money raised and April we did all of our casting May was pre-production we shot in June June July and then we edited August, September, October, mixed it, everything else. We were like a done deal by Christmas. It was insane. So I was just like, great. And then, you know, come spring of this coming year, well, the movie will come out. And then we did a year of festivals. And then it took almost another year to get the film finally distributed. Um, it came out on Tuesday, by the way. I mean, it, it literally took, it was a long and winding road. As for Kickstarter, we needed to raise $60,000. Um, th roughly, which included what we w we'd anticipated we would be spending on prizes, and we ended up raising two hundred and seven thousand dollars and change, which is just unbelievable. We're, we're I think like the thirteenth most fundraised film on Kickstarter, which is shocking. Hi, um, I'm curious um, in terms of why you chose to, I guess, live in New York versus L.A. to pursue your artistic vision and, and work and how did that play into any of the movie or in, in inspire anything in it? Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the infamous New York versus LA question. I could talk about this ad nauseum and if I'd been drinking beforehand, I probably would. Um, let's roll. Um, let's go. <laughs> you ready? Um, we'll no, the, no, uh, the whiskey. No. Hold on. Long story short, um, I lived in Los Angeles for seven years and uh, the city was very good to me and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I think, I absolutely think that I, I never would have made this film had I stayed there, um, and with no offense to Los Angeles. For me, I mean, in a nutshell, if I were to like really dumb it down, my experience, it would be like, if I were talking about Besides Still Waters, I would say, oh, I made this movie, and I feel like in New York, the first question would be, well, what's it about? And if in Los Angeles, the first question would be like, well, how much money did it make? Or who's your lead? Like, well, who's the talent? Who's, who's, who's producing? Like, it was sort of, 
uh, th- you know, that's that's an industry town first and foremost, and you can't escape the entertainment industry there. And I feel like in New York, um, you know, I don't know if it's because the there's so many because of the fine art community here or the theater community here, but there's such a a, a respect for art for art's sake, and um, I, I just think it was a really nourishing environment for me, which is why I moved here and stayed here. I love this city. I'm drunk on it. Go for it. What's up, dude? Hello, how are you? Why, was there, did you say why you picked Michigan? No, no I didn't. Um, oh, okay. So the, the original uh, home, and then we'll get you front here. Don't, don't you worry. I'm not, you're not going away. Um, so we, we, uh, the film was actually inspired by the home where I grew up in Georgia, and we, we wanted to shoot in Georgia, I think, originally, even though we didn't have the house anymore. I think it was just sort of, for me, for cathartically, I wanted to shoot there. Um, but to be perfectly honest, we couldn't get um, the incentive that Georgia offers because our budget was too low. Um, And so we were really trying to find a place that felt like anywhere America. And by that I mean, we didn't want to shoot in a house in the Northeast because it's so clearly the Northeast, I feel like, when when you see that landscape. And same with the West Coast. And Michigan has just some of the most gorgeous, um, lakes in the world and more than that also Michigan has this incredible film community that was really thriving for years and then they went through all sorts of um, film tax incentive cuts and a lot of people who had moved there full time invested in equipment and homes all of a sudden the, the entertainment industry just left so we ended up getting this spectacular crew that we never would have been able to afford in in New York or LA, frankly. I mean, I remember that's something that Tim always talked about. Like, we were really blown away by the crew that we got. Um, and then there were, and then there ended up being all these serendipitous things that happened. For example, the protagonist has this real obsession with Ernest Hemingway, and the house where we shot in Petoskey, Michigan, we literally shot next door to the Hemingway estate, um, where where you know Ernie wrote. Uh, up in Michigan, all the sort of Nick Adams stories. So at a certain point, it just felt like we were in the right place. But that was the original reason that we went with Michigan. Yeah. Let's do it. Last question. Last but not least. Let's go. Um, You talked about writing the script as more of a writing exercise. At what point did you know you wanted to direct it? And did you find it difficult to then get the job, I guess, as the director? Um, well, so what I mean by an exercise is that uh, Mo had never written in the past. I'd never written with a writing partner. So it, it was so we sort of took the pressure off of ourselves, which is really nice. Um, and also, I had no idea how to even make a movie. So that's why I don't think I ever thought it was going to happen. And then what happened was I was shooting a film. The producers, like anyone else, I was like, hey, read this. Give us notes. And they read it. And then three days later, they're like, let's make it. Um, and, and so one thing I, I definitely had to accept is... I think there's this delusion that you can sort of act in between as you're prepping a film or something like that. And, and, and very, what I learned very quickly is it's, there's so many ways a film can not get made. There's so many times where it can fall apart that for me, I just had to be completely on board. So the moment we said we were going to do it, I just called my reps and said, like, I can't do any acting jobs for this year. I just have to totally only do this thing. Otherwise, it'll, it'll just never happen. How did your reps respond? Uh, well, I'm still trying to get them to call me back, but eventually <laughs> I think they're going to be really happy with me. Um, thank you guys so much, Thanks, by guys. the way, for coming out. Thank really. You.